Hey what is up guys, this is Total War KS. In today's video, I will be showing 10 things I wish I knew before playing a Total War Sega Troy. Starting off at number 1 with upkeep reduction. In order to reduce the upkeep of our armies, we need to employ the Asian Envoy. First, we will need to build Megaron from the administration section to unlock this agent. Next, we need to embed it into an army which will give us a 10% upkeep reduction. There are more skills that you can further unlock to achieve a maximum of 35% upkeep reduction and in some cases, the agent starts off with an extra 5%, making the maximum 40%. In order to level up the agent, I recommend performing actions on our own settlements every single turn, rather than being embedded to an army as it will take way too long for the envoy to level up. Then, we can save our skill points only on the relevant skills that reduces upkeep, such as Inspired Speaker, Charmer, Precise into Austere, and finally Encouraging Companion. We may also want to wait until level 14 as we can then unlock Immortality for our Envoy. As Immortality means that the Envoy can be wounded but never killed, ensuring we never lose that fat 40% upkeep reduction bonus for our armies. After all that, if we still have spare skill points, we can look for bonuses that help strengthen our army. Number 2. Divine Will, a new special feature unique to Total War Troy where you can perform prayers and sacrifices for bonus effects. For each god or goddess we select, we are able to perform two rituals, Prayer and Hecatomb. Let us first take a look at Prayer. We can perform this once per turn for any particular god or goddess of our choosing. I would highly recommend the Prayer effect of the Goddess of Aphrodite at all times as it grants us 20 growth and 2 happiness. We can see the effects we will be getting when we hover over their icon, with the box saying prayer to Aphrodite in this case. Once we have selected a prayer, the effect will take place in the following turn, and it will last for a total of 4 turns, which we can then see on the top left of our screen. Now moving on to Hecatomb. When performing this ritual, we will immediately gain favor of a god or goddess, with each giving us a different bonus effects, there are 3 levels. With 50 favor, we gain our first level, then we will need 300 for the second, and then 600 for the third. This may seem difficult to achieve at first, but once we reach the later stages of our campaign, we can build a temple in each and every single city, so that we are able to maintain the favor for multiple god or goddess. In general, Ares grants bonus morale and melee attack to sword and axe units. So if that is the main units within our army, we may want to prioritize this over others. Hera gives bonuses to slingers, Apollo give bonuses to archers, and Athena give bonuses to spear units, etc. The cooldown for performing Hecatomb is 5 turns and you can see the active effects on the top left of the screen. Number 3, Colonization. A simple tip here is to never use our main army to colonize any villages or cities because it will take away half of our troops to settle the new place, making us waste multiple turns to replenish our troops. What we can do instead is recruit a hero temporarily and use him to colonize that region instead. This way, it will save us multiple turns worth of movement and not lose half of our army. Number 4, Building Optimization. Within a city, we should always build the two buildings that provide happiness and influence within the administration section first as this will allow us to stabilize our provinces, preventing any potential rebellions. Next, we definitely want to have a military building like the muster field that will provide the staple infantry units, especially in the early game, or a chariot assembly once you have enough wood and bronze to supply chariots. Later on, we may want to specialize a city with mostly military buildings to recruit the best troops with extra added bonuses. Now the next thing I would recommend building is a garrison, either the Trojan Gate or the Guardhouse depending on what faction we have selected. We can also skip this if we think the location of a province is safe from our enemy's reach, but if there are any chances that the enemies could attack this province, then I will always build a garrison, especially when we are at war with multiple factions at the same time. Next, we would want to build a temple. This way we can increase the favor of a particular god or goddess from the Divine Will tab, as well as unlocking the recruitment of a priestess that can help towards public order. For the remaining slots, we can really build anything we see fit. 
from faction-specific buildings to building that increases resource income. Moving on to the villages, similar to cities, I would also recommend to build a garrison here. Then the next two buildings should be from the resource section. We can choose from the first or the fourth option, as the rest of the other buildings all have a negative effect, whether it is on influence, happiness, or growth. In the case of having a port, which takes away a building slot, then we can start off with the first option, then later demolish it to build the fourth option, as it costs significantly more resources to build, but provide much higher income. Number 5. Broken versus Shattered In this particular Total War, it is extremely difficult to make enemies completely shatter to the point of no return. It is important that we distinguish the difference between broken and shattered. Broken means that the enemies have lost the will to fight, but they will return if given enough time. Shattered, on the other hand, has similar meaning, except they will never return back to the battlefield. The way to spot this is to understand that the running icon means broken, and the skull icon means shattered. Therefore, you should never let the enemies go until the skull icon appears. Oftentimes, I find myself routing masses of enemies, thinking the battle is almost over, only for them to return back to the battlefield flanking my entire army, turning the tide of a close battle. Number 6. Unifaction Buffs Each faction is given a unique mechanism tailored for that specific faction. It is important for us to take a look at it and understand how it works before playing our campaign further. For example, when playing as Paris of Troy, we may have to deal with the adverse effects of it, if not dealt with properly. Or when playing as Achilles, there will be events popping up periodically that we can choose on how he reacts. There are both positives and negatives, so be careful when making a decision and not leave it idle. Number 7. Army Composition Generally, we would want 6 shielded infantry as our frontline, followed up by 4 light infantry who usually are experts in flanking or have a great charge, so that we are able to win the battles on the flanks and eventually come around to flank the enemy center. Next, we would want 5 missile units. So far, I personally find slingers more effective overall than archers, whether it is against other missile units or against infantry units. To finally wrap up our composition, a group of 4 chariots would do nicely, as these units can help break through the enemy flanks and frontline, or chase down the enemy missile units at the rear. Later on, we can employ more expensive and beefier troops, but the concept of our composition should remain similar. Number 8. Group Attack Similar to all other Total War games, we can have our army attack individual units without the need to click on every single one ourselves. First, select all the units we intend to attack with, space them out properly, and press Ctrl G in order to lock them in the same group. Next, we want to right click and attack the enemy center for our units to path correctly. Then, we can just sit back and enjoy the battle unfold. Number 9. Siege Defense When up against a large invasion force, having a garrison bell is especially useful as we have a chance to repel and deny further advances without the need to send any armies to deal with them. We should always start off by scouting where the enemy's position can be at so that we can position accordingly. Generally, have the weaker unit up front to soak up missile damage and then have other infantry nearby to stack on top of the choke point once the enemy closes in. If there are any loopholes in the enemy positioning, make sure to punish them by sallying forth with our best flanking units, preferably light infantry who has added bonuses in flanking. Once the enemy engage at the choke point, we should proceed to wrap around and choke them out. Next step is probably the most important step. If the enemy has more or superior range units, then I am sorry there is a very high chance we will get wiped. On the off chance that we have superior missile units, make sure to line them up nicely behind the choke point with the most enemies so that our infantry can hold them off whilst our missile units can actually do most of the killing. Also, try to prioritize taking out enemy missile units because they will also be the main source of damage that will take out our front line. Number 10. Trading a simple tip to effectively trade with other factions, when we have the Diplomacy tab opened, select any faction, and at the bottom right of the screen we can see their amount of resources. Red means it is abundant, green means it is lacking. So we can trade accordingly, and especially when we are over abundant, 
with a particular resource. We can then trade it for the other types with different factions so that we can make the most out of our resources, allowing us to advance our cities and villages faster. So that's it for 10 things I wish I knew before playing a Total War Sega Troy. Let me know in the comment section down below whether you agree or disagree and what would your personal list look like. If you found the video helpful, make sure to leave a thumbs up and subscribe for more content. And as always, thank you guys for watching, I will see you guys next time, goodbye.